Welcome back to Fun with Crypto, where this time you'll learn about Keyhash Message Authentication Code, better known as HMAC. Let's quickly review why we are here, and that is to prove the integrity of a message. As you recall, if Alice sends a message to Bob over an untrusted network, then an adversary could change the message. And even if the message is encrypted, the adversary could change the ciphertext which would leave Bob with a corrupted message. Or, if Bob is a database instead of a person, the database would be corrupted. At the same time, we learned that Alice can take a hash of the message, and if Bob takes a hash of the same message and the two values are equal, then Bob knows he has received the message intact. However, our adversary can both change the message and generate a new hash such that Bob will believe the message is authentic. Therefore, the hash alone is not enough, and we need a way to authenticate the hash value. Previously, we saw this can be done with asymmetric key cryptography. That is, if Alice signs the hash with her private key, then Bob can decrypt the signature back to the hash with Alice's public key, and know that the adversary cannot generate a different hash without having Alice's private key to sign it. But asymmetric key cryptography is very slow compared to hashing and symmetric key encryption. Therefore, there's a desire to create a hash tied to a shared secret key. Now recall that if we have a hash of some message, and if we only change the message slightly, the resulting hash will change dramatically. Therefore, we can use this fact to create a message authentication code, commonly called a MAC, by just appending a secret key to a hash of a message. Unfortunately, for the SHA-1 and SHA-2 algorithms, the MAC is vulnerable to a message extension attack by man in the middle. In addition to that very serious problem, if the underlying hash algorithm gets broken, as we saw with MD5 and SHA-1, then simply appending the secret to the message, it will get broken too. These are the reasons for the creation of the HMAC algorithm. That is, the HMAC algorithm is not susceptible to a message extension attack and it may be secure even with an insecure hash algorithm such as MD5 and SHA-1. So, let's take a look at the HMAC algorithm. The HMAC of some key K and some message M is the stuff on the right of the equal sign, which we will analyze in a second. First, note that K is a shared secret key, M is the message to be hashed, H is a hash function such as SHA-2, the circle with a plus sign in it is the XOR function, and the two vertical lines indicate concatenation, that is, appending the message on the right of the two vertical lines to the message on the left. Now let's analyze the right side of the equation. Let's start here. This says the key k is XORed with the hexadecimal value 363636 repeating to the block size of the underlying hash algorithm, which is 512 bits for the SHA-256 algorithm. Then the message m is appended to the XORed key and the first hash is taken where the hash, H, is typically SHA-2, but can be SHA-3, SHA-1, or even MD5. Then, the same key K is XORed with hexadecimal 5C, 5C, 5C repeating, and the previous hash is appended, and the final hash is taken. Therefore, the HMAC function consists of two hash operations with a single key that is transformed into essentially two different keys through the XOR operation. One question is, what size key should be used? With SHA-256, the ideal key is 512 bits long because that is the block size of the SHA-256 algorithm. With SHA-512 and SHA-384, the ideal key is 1024 bits. If the keys are shorter than the ideal, they will be padded with zeros. If the keys are longer, then extra step will be performed. The key will be hashed down to the ideal size for the underlying hash algorithm. As an example, let's take a very non-random 512-bit key consisting of the string 0 through 9, A through F, repeated 8 times. Since the key is 512 bits long, we do not need to pad it or hash it. We will XOR the key with 363636 repeating to get this value, which is another very non-random value. To make matters worse, the message will be a very non-random value too just a 64-bit string of zeros, possibly representing the first value of a 64-bit counter. 
After concatenating those two values together and taking a SHA-256 hash, we get this value. Okay, things are starting to look better. This looks much more like a pseudo-random number. Now we will take the original key and XOR it with 5C, 5C, 5C repeated to get the other XOR key. And finally, concatenate the first hash value to it and compute the second hash value, which is the HMAC value. Okay, that looks pretty unique, especially considering its inputs. So let's summarize a few things here. We saw that encryption of the message does not provide integrity, and even a hash by itself is not sufficient to provide integrity either. One could encrypt a hash with a private key of a private key public key pair, but it is slow. We saw that we could append a shared secret key to a message to create a message authentication code, or MAC, but then learned that it was susceptible to a message extension attack. Finally, we learned about the keyed hash message authentication code, or HMAC, that provides authenticated integrity. HMAC is used for integrity checking in the TLS 1.2 suites that use the Cypher blockchaining mode. Most of the other algorithms use Galois counter mode, which uses the Galois hash instead of the HMAC. You should also know that in the newest versions of TLS, that is TLS 1.3, the HMAC is used for the key derivation function. You recall that in TLS, one of the goals of the handshake is to agree on a master key. That master key is then turned into two symmetric keys and either two MAC keys or two initialization vectors via the key derivation function. Well, in TLS 1.3, the HMAC is used for that key derivation function. There you have it, the keyed hash message authentication code, better known as HMAC. Join us next time for more fun with crypto.